Barely Research Facts is a fact-based podcast brought to you by Art Now Das, an experiential arts agency based at Mumbai. Each week, we pick a word at random, dive into it and see where it brings us. We are your hosts. My name is Ragini and this is Shar. Hi and welcome back to another episode of Barely Research Facts. What's our word for this week? For this episode? How would we say this week? <laughs> our word for this episode is geek. Geek, yeah. This was a fun one. It was. And I thought, you know, going into it, I was thinking, oh, I know exactly what I want to do. I know exactly what my research is going to go like. And it's in the bag. And then I actually started looking it up. And the amount of emotions, like the emotional range <laughs> I had during the research of the topic was interesting. It went from horror to disgust to aww mm. to everything in between. <laughs> so I'm excited to get into it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, the internet really throws back for this word. Yeah, it does. Yeah, in fact, you have to sift through a lot of stuff yeah. before you hit gold. So let's just first, let's talk about what the word geek means to us now. So a geek is usually, we see them as an enthusiast mm. who develops a great amount of knowledge on a particular topic. So someone who, say, for instance, watched lockpicking videos on YouTube, <laughs> which is a thing. Dean's friend does this. Shout out to Richard, <laughs> who watches lock picking videos and like that is a very particular niche. Yeah, he you know is learning how to pick mm-hmm. locks. Don't ask me why, but he is. So someone who just you know takes a topic and just knows a lot about it. And I think geeks they're really associated with like pop culture and things like the Avengers and like fantasy fiction and Dungeons and Dragons, things like that. But then when I looked up the origins of the word geek, it threw back <laughs> this interesting little factlet. So the word geek derives from a late 19th century English dialect word, geck, and it means fool. The word has a Germanic origin. And I think, correct me if I'm wrong, Dutch speakers who listen to our <laughs> podcast. But geck, the word geck in Dutch means mad or silly. So going straight down to the crazy, have you heard of these people called carnival geeks? No, I'm guessing it's not people who are like extremely obsessive about carnivals. <laughs> Actually, you know what? There might be a subsection of people who I'm like <laughs> mislabeling you. <here>. No, but <laughs> good point. But um, the geeks Thanks. I'm talking about. So in the early 20th century, geeks were part of most circus troops and they were they were part of the freak shows. Usually they were used as a precursor to a freak show, a small tidbit of entertainment before the actual freak show started. And they had a specialty. Mm -hmm. What is their specialty, you ask, Ragini? Biting the heads of animals, typically chickens, snakes (laughs) or rats, and drinking their blood in front of a live audience. Okay, um, I guess that was entertaining (laughs) back in the day. I was thinking about this. I can't get on board. I've been trying very hard to get on board with it. Right <laughs> you don't now, have to. Please don't. You can give them the benefit of the doubt. Because I was thinking about this. So this is like the early 20th century. So, and the last, like, say, public execution was only in the mid 1800s. So they had a good 60, 70 years where they were starved for like, I don't know, gruesome entertainment. But I think people were desensitized a bit at that time. Maybe. I'm, maybe I'm making assumptions. So anyway, coming back to um, Carnival Geeks, all the stuff that they did, it frequently caused broken teeth and jaws. Eesh. And yeah, and the constant like, obviously eating raw animal that has been God knows where caused them like animal related sicknesses. They were usually billed in the show as subhuman freaks. So sometimes they were just like this old drunk guy who they'd pick up off the street who would be willing to do these things. And they were they could often also be paid in alcohol or drugs, <laughs> especially during prohibition. Wow. So that's quite a journey huh, for the geek. I mean, this is like a particularly undesirable set of the population. <laughs> I imagine. I know. I mean, obviously desperate times for them, I guess. But it's interesting how they went from the word geek meaning like fool or silly or whatever to referring to carnival geeks and now to like a nice, like almost like positive. Relatively, yeah. <laughs> yeah suddenly the word geek just sounds like <laughs> high praise. I'm happy that the that geeks have like reclaimed the word. <laughs> As an aside, I did want to talk about a little bit of like carny lingo or like vocabulary. Yeah, well, you really went deep down this. I know, school, I huh? went in a spiral <laughs> and it's just, I'm only now crawling back out of it. But So carnival staff, they usually had like this cant, which was a secret language. So you know, like how you add like P language and things like that, where you just like, I think you you can do P language, can't you? I'm proficient 
Yeah. <laughs> give us a sample. <laughs> uh give me a, give me a lyra okay. this it. this style eventually turned into geek culture the pista pile a pen pen chipper lippy tipper a pin to pug peak kapal chipper oh well done me i <laughs> i didn't need anyone to praise me <laughs> i'm like my own audience applause yeah. like editor please include like a roll of <laughs> <laughs> applause here <laughs> But yeah I I just it blew my mind a bit because obviously they've the carnival culture been around for ages and they they travel a lot and travel together so obviously you'd come up with lingo so can I just go through just quickly a couple of them of course we must <laughs> okay 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 so bc and completely different from bc in india <laughs> bc is be cool and it's not like be uh. cool as in don't be uncool it's more like a warning to stop what you're doing or saying say if you started ranting and you were like saying something you shouldn't be saying then someone would be like bc bc chill out oh oh so it's like a shut up yeah it's a warning uh-huh. and then there's guess what they called a child like a singular child <laughs> punk a punk okay come here you little punk i think it sounds very american could be american and then yeah. <laughs> a, a galloper <laughs> was used to refer to a oh. merry go round cute that's okay. cute hey do you want to do you want to ride on the galloper <laughs> sounds a bit rude now when i say it <laughs> sorry <laughs> i wonder which woman said yes to that <laughs> <laughs> and then we've got the longest one which is mr and mrs wood and all the little woods which means empty seats in a house okay oh not so all when you're like living depends on it but yeah empty seats in a house yeah oh, there's okay. there's a whole list oh, don't creative. worry we'll put the link in the blog that goes with this episode <laughs> but very interesting quite cool yeah and talking about lingo so coming back to the word geek so we know now what it used to mean it's very interesting and gruesome history to now where geek culture is become a machine of its own it's so lucrative as an industry <laughs> i just wanted to quickly rattle off some numbers so comic con apparently has over 130,000 attendees the new york comic con it's wow. insane and apparently in the last year when they had to obviously make it online because of a certain c word they had mm. more than 300 panels and it was its 51st year and they had over 200,000 people attending some of wow. the events which is insane yeah it is quite an industry now i mean and it's quite a mo- like it's quite a money making industry yeah. as well but what i also realized in this is that you know historically because geeks tend to like sort of focus on one one topic and you you just go really mm. deep into it there were too many niches of what could encompass geek culture and so to create like conventions for each specific interest would be too much and it would mm-hmm. be too vast and so they started bringing smaller interest groups together and sort of creating conventions out of these collection of interest group and that's what eventually gave birth to geek conventions as we see them today and also it prompted this cross pollination across geek interests and i mean basically gave birth to what now we define as a canonical list of geek interests and what has now become modern day geek culture yeah a very odd link so when i think of for someone who's a geek or even a nerd i think of and by the way this isn't like pejorative this isn't uh, negative in any way i'd consider myself geeky and nerdy in a lot of ways as well there's this link to being almost pedantic about good and evil and you know i was mm. looking it up online and there have been some lines drawn between like geeks and nerds being quick sorted based on don quixote okay. basically and for yeah. people who you know may not know don quixote was this character in a novel by miguel de cervantes and he's a nobleman who reads so many like chivalric novels that he loses his mind and he apparently can't sleep either so it adds to it i'm guessing and he decides to become like a knight errant you know so there's a connection drawn between ideology that nerds and geeks tend to have and don quixote and being quick sorted basically Mm. So I thought that was really interesting. Right, yeah. Cuz I would say that I am a bit like that. I was a bit like that and then the world tore me down. Like the idea <laughs> of just really romanticizing certain ideas of good and evil and placing it within a character and then sort of living it through that character. Yeah. Yeah. Or right? Yeah. Yeah, that's quite uh, In fact, very interesting aside to this, but there's a proper academic study that's been conducted on geek culture, and one of the hypotheses that they've come up with is called the Great Fantasy Migration Hypothesis. To really sum it this up, according to the study, there is a very strong link between geek culture and narcissism. Oh. <laughs> uh there has been a lot of counter to this, but the idea of just sort of wanting to escape into fantasy, it, it almost suggests that you know you're trying to escape reality and you don't want to confront reality and so you go into these delusions of grandeur by living your life 
through these fantastical mm. characters that you become obsessed with. And so the study is trying to establish some link to certain narcissistic personality traits and geek culture. There has been a lot of criticism, however, around this. Yeah, I want to criticize it because I feel like this is directed at me. Yeah, a lot of yeah, a lot of other <laughs> geeks have also, uh, with the same motivation, <laughs> criticized it. There is a case study of this patient in an asylum. His name was Kirk Allen. And he had an extraordinary fantasy life that was modeled on science fiction. Mm -hmm. And he believed at the same time that he was a scientist on Earth and simultaneously an interplanetary emperor. See, I can relate to that. Yeah, he believed very genuinely that he could enter his other life by mental time travel into the far off future where his destiny awaited him with scenes of power, respect and conquest, both military and sexual. It does seem like very one end of the spectrum. If we bell curved this, he would be at like... He would be really at the <laughs> complete edge. So One of the extremes. And in the same breath, Ursula Le Guin, who is a very popular science fiction author, has spoken about how one of the essential gestures of science fiction is sort of allows people to do is sort of pull themselves back from the reality that we're living in and therefore view it in order to see it better. Mm. So what it does is if you have a piece of science fiction that pulls you into the universe at large, rather than just establishing you as, you know, on planet Earth, suddenly you're able to pull yourself back from the reality that you're a part of and be able to see a much larger picture. And therefore, it allows you to make much more sense of the society of your time, showing afresh your peculiar psychology, culture and politics in a way that you would not if you were completely immersed in it. So they're both sides of the equation. I think I tend to agree with the latter as well. Mm, but I like it. <laughs> I, I do feel like a lot of the criticism comes from there and you kind of like just... Fancied of the language a little bit. Because I, I mean, obviously there is there is a psychological element behind why people are drawn, like certain people are drawn to it and others aren't, etc. But yeah, and there are other theories like, you know, I mean, there could just be a sense to sort of have, to belong to something bigger than yourself or belong to a community. And, you know, so those are also like yeah. equally valid hypotheses or to just engage with something much more deeply because that this is one of them. Cool. So obviously, when I looked up Carnival Geeks, or when I found Carnival Geeks, the first mm. thing I thought of was, are there any present day Carnival Geeks? Do we have versions of that? Or, you know, obviously, health and safety, <laughs> I don't think they'd be chewing the heads of chickens. But I found this artist called Joe Coleman, who is equal parts scary, but equal parts awe-inspiring to me. <laughs> So he calls himself a geek and the kind of geek that I was talking about earlier, which is a carnival geek, he's a self-styled geek. He's described as the quintessential outsider artist for the end of this century. Ooh. So most of my research was from two sources. One was his website and the other was this article published mm -hmm. in this magazine called Esoterra. It was an interview with Joe Coleman by this gentleman called Chad Hensley. And so he's just an interesting human being and artist. Mm -hmm. He does things like blowing himself up with explosives after biting the heads of mice Ooh. during his performance art piece that he performs under the alias and alter ego Professor Mombuzo. Wow, so people are still biting <laughs> the heads of animals. So he's done many different kinds of things. He does like these art projects. I'd say they're like extreme of art. They're not what you'd usually see in the mainstream. But you know, he does things like there's video of him. I'll put it along with the blog post. But there's video of him blowing himself up. Okay. Like with explosives mm. inside him? I or think you should watch it. <laughs> <laughs> I won't spoil okay. it for anybody. But it's interesting. And apparently his work is filled with unfolding apocalypses, freak show attractions and portraits of tragic personalities ranging from Jane Mansfield to Charles Manson. So judging wow. by the subject matter he chooses, <laughs> you know that he's a bit like extreme. <laughs> and I think obviously he is at the heart of it. He is a painter, he's a filmmaker and he's a performance artist. I've seen some of his paintings. They're, you know, they're really interesting. There's obviously a, tons of skill in there, but also there's vision and it's kind of grotesque, but also beautiful. So I'll put a couple of examples and I'll link to his website if anybody is interested in immersing themselves in the world of Joe Coleman. <laughs> I really want to see how he blows himself up and how he's still alive. Yeah, it's, he's still alive, right? Yeah, yeah he's alive. <laughs> and he's been around for, you know, quite a long time. He's apparently he's been around since the 70s. His paintings have been around for ages. He's done movie posters. He's been in a couple of movies. I don't think they've been very mainstream movies, but he has been in them. And apparently his philosophy is simple, in his words. We're living in a time of death and he is the Antichrist documenting these days with his paintings. 
His art has been on book covers, on comics, on records, on Hollywood movie posters. Fairly like prolific, but I'd never heard of him. Come to think of it, do you think about the artists behind a movie poster? Like now, obviously, people on Instagram and things get shout outs and, you know, get publicized. But no, but like, I mean, I would imagine that if someone's eating the heads of mice and blowing themselves up, you know, you just hear about them a little bit more because how many people are doing that? It is true. <laughs> One of his movies, series of like performance pieces was called Suburban Subversion. And it was basically where he crashes suburban parties in Connecticut with explosives strapped to his chest. Yeah, it's not just a party crash. This isn't like cutesy, like romantic comedy, like wedding crashers with like Owen <laughs> <laughs> No, this is kind of like a twist. <laughs> but some of his comments about his work, Coleman's bitter intensity and microscopic detail give his apocalyptic vision a manic power. These are quotes. I'll put them in the blog post as well. Interesting. This is simply Joe Coleman. His art is something else. Praise, praise. He's a caveman in a spaceship. Yeah, he's a very interesting human being. And I recommend yeah. if people yeah, if people want to spend an afternoon spiraling, <laughs> enjoy. So basically, I went down this massive rabbit hole on geek trivia in my research. Okay. There is so much stuff. It's amazing. But I came across a few that I found quite interesting. One of which is around this lady called Jo Trimble. Mm -hmm. And so it's actually a husband-wife duo. And they are heavily credited with being a part of a campaign called the Save Star Trek campaign. <laughs> I love it which, already. Yeah, which allowed the series to run for an additional third season rather than being cancelled after two. What? Uh, the other campaign that they are particularly associated with and have played a huge hand in is they basically campaigned to NASA to have the first of NASA's space shuttles named Enterprise after the spaceship on Star Trek. Aww. And what this earned them, it's very sweet, but what this earned them is uncredited roles as crew members in Star Trek The Motion Picture. Oh. Uh, and they were allowed to play extras in full costume. Oh, bless. I love that. I know. I, I, I love Trekkies. They're so involved. <laughs> <laughs> and let them know. <laughs> um, and then the, a couple of others. One is a little bit of Superman trivia. Mm -hmm. Apparently, in the original Superman, as envisaged, the character was A, not called Clark Kent. He was called Bill Dunn. Bill Dunn was a homeless man who was waiting in line in a soup kitchen when a professor, Ernest Smalley, offers him food and new clothes in exchange for his participation in an experiment. Oh. What this then did, yeah, was that he gave him a portion that makes him telepathic and then also eventually turns him into Superman. But Superman was not the good Superman we know now. He develops a taste for power and in the process kills Professor Smalley, tries to take over the world, but realizes that he needs the portion to continue to have his powers and then he doesn't know how to make the potion and eventually he goes back to a life without powers and back to the soup kitchen line. <laughs> Oh, that's a quick week-long yeah. adventure. <laughs> Gets superpowers, <laughs> kills someone. Oh, oh no, I'm back in the soup kitchen. <laughs> yeah, yeah, really? <laughs> yeah, quick turn around there. <laughs> also, interestingly, I like how they've chosen the most boring name for him. I think the last name Dunn has, the word has origins in the word brown. Really? Yeah, because I, I remember reading hmm. a book where a Scottish character was called Dun Bonnet and in Gaelic, Dun means brown. Oh, wow. Look at that. Random fact. -like. Pouting out information. <laughs> yeah, apparently, eventually his name was changed from Bill Dunn to Clark Kent uh, and he was named after actors Kent Taylor and Clark Cable. Oh, what? Mm. Wow, that yeah. blows my mind. I, I genuinely thought that Clark Kent would have come after Superman. I don't know why. <laughs> but that's that's. Cool, yeah. So they named him after a movie star. More glamorous than Bill Brown. Yeah, movie stars. <laughs> All right. So last question uh, for my Greek trivia bit. Why do superheroes wear their underwear outside of their pants? This is a big discussion online, by the way. <laughs> I don't know. I, I, I want to say aesthetics. <laughs> yeah, you're not, you're not far off, actually. Really? I was joking. Um, <laughs> no, but you're... Yeah. Really? <laughs> Yeah. So apparently, you know, it's supposed that superheroes were attired to mimic circus performers and acrobatics because, you know, the kind of stunts that they did yeah. was sort of akin to the kind of stunts that circus performers and acrobatics were doing. And because acrobats wear these really tight leggings and they wear these shorts over those leggings, you mm. know, the circus performer outfit, superheroes were, were styled accordingly and therefore they started wearing their underwear outside of their pants. Cool. I'm sure acrobats, like modern day acrobats are like, you're welcome. 
<laughs> yeah, there is also another very interesting theory around this, which is you know the most superheroes lost their parents at a very early age. Oh, yeah, and so no one really could tell them where the underwear goes. Oh and no, so... that's such a mean joke. <laughs> I'm laughing but it's a really <laughs> dark joke. <laughs> but that is also apparently another origin for why superheroes wear their underwear over their pants. Cool. Just a sad child. <laughs> <laughs> I have a little bit of I don't know if it's trivia but it I laughed when I read it okay. <laughs> and I think I must share the joy. So you obviously heard of the phrase geek chic, right? I haven't. Oh. Ah, oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, uh, living under a rock. <laughs> Am I? <laughs> Your reaction, I felt like I should feel ashamed. I know, I don't, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to shame you, but um, shame on you for not knowing geek chic. <laughs> Apart from being really, uh, having a real cool rhyme scheme, it refers basically to a minor fashion trend. So that's probably why you don't know, Ratni, you were playing big leagues. I was like playing with the minor, minor fashion trends. Um, in the mid 2000s, it's around the time that we'd be growing up, you know, be interest, start being interested in fashion and things, mm. in which young people adopted geeky, quote unquote, geeky fashions such as like oversized black horn rimmed glasses suspender braces or high water trousers which is basically like trousers that end a little higher than your ankles so like what my mom would say what are you preparing for a flood or what <laughs> <laughs> and the rest of the stuff sort of fell off the map but the glasses continued to become the defining aspect of the trend and with the media identifying various celebrities as quote unquote trying geek or going geek for wearing such glasses. And can you, in your mm -hmm. wildest imagination, think of two famous celebrity men named as having followed this trend? I don't know. Uh, Brad Pitt? Mm, not, not too bad. <laughs> I don't know why, but it made me laugh yeah. when it said, such as David Beckham and Justin Timberlake. <laughs> But, you know, the big glasses are still quite current, aren't they? Yeah. I mean, I yeah, have the big glasses. glasses are still there. Ooh. Okay, I have one last thing before we sign off. Okay, so this is part of our pop culture segment. Oh, God, you're song. waiting for me to do the sound, aren't you? Pop culture! Woo! <laughs> okay, so my pop culture fact is not about the word geek, but it's a related term. It's the word nerds. So, okay. close enough. Okay. Uh, and it's particularly about Nerds Candy. Okay. So Nerds Candy was created by the Willy Wonka Candy Factory in 1983. And the Wonka brand was created as a marketing ploy to promote the movie Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory, debuting one month before the film released in 1971. Oh. Now, the confectionery was founded by Quaker Oats Company in 1971. Now, there's nothing unusual about that, but they agreed to fund the production of the movie Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory. So at the time, Quaker Oats was interested in pursuing chocolate and director Mel Stewart was looking for his next big break. If Stewart could get Quaker to agree to part with the rights of, they bought the rights to Roald Dahl's book, mm -hmm. Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, uh, and if he could agree to get them to part with the rights and to fund the film, he would be able to make his film. So Quaker agreed to give him the rights and to fund the film only and only if the film adaptation would be renamed to Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory because then they could promote their Willy Wonka candy factory. Wow, I wonder the if they knew how much it would pay off. Well, they had some idea, I'm guessing, considering it was pretty much part of the contract and the only clause that was standing in his way to getting his film funded. That's, I mean, that's really amazing because really, you know, I mean, you can never tell whether a film is going to be successful, but that's a huge gamble and it totally paid off. And yeah, and then thereafter, they launched Nerds Candy in 1983, which grew so much actually that in 1985, Nerds Candy was named Candy of the Year by something called the National Candy Wholesalers Association. Yep, I trust them. <laughs> <laughs> I agree. I think I would too. I think they sound quite legit. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so that's it. That's the pop culture segment. That's the episode. Entire geek episode. Look at that. <laughs> Just wrapping up all things all together. We hope you've enjoyed <laughs> and we'll see you next time. Bye. That's it for today. The episode you just heard was edited by Mohit Chandelier. Music for the episode is by Charita Arora. If you liked the episode, if you'd like to talk to us about the episode, or if you have a word you'd like us to research, Drop us a message, we'd love to hear from you. We're on Instagram at Barely Research Facts, or you could visit our website www.artnadas.in. We'll see you next time.